Okay. How are you guys? Good? Did you have a good week? I'm, I'm good, yeah. So, um, but I, it looks like there are fewer of you. I hope we haven't lost anyone. Or maybe it's just the subject is too easy for some people. So, well, we also have the, this wonderful resource. So, uh, for those watching online, welcome. But do come to visit us sometimes. You know. All right, so we are talking about um, uh, integrals, right? And um, I know that last week we discussed uh, double integrals and triple integrals. And for double integrals, you talked about uh, integration using polar coordinates. And um, so this is actually a very, um, it's a very useful uh, tool for integration that sometimes things simplify uh, when you use uh, some interesting stuff on the, on the floor. When you use um, a different coordinate system. We, we saw that when we talked about uh, as early as like a second, uh, first or second week of the class. Hello. I, you guys are lacking discipline after, you know, not having me for a week? I hope not. So, you know, remember that I'm really, hard, you know, strict, but fair. So, all right. Um, so already at the very beginning we saw that many, uh, our solutions simplify when we use polar coordinates, for example, in describing um, uh, curves on the plane. And uh, you saw last week that integration also simplifies. Double integrals simplify if you use polar coordinates. So now the next question is, what about triple integrals? Is there an analog of a polar coordinate system for triple integrals? And how can we use uh, such a coordinate system to effectively evaluate triple integrals? And in fact, because now we are in three dimensions, there is more than one choice to make, there are, there, are, there are more options, and there are two particular coordinate systems which are very convenient in three dimensions, which are called cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. So we will uh, discuss them in turn. First we'll talk about cylindrical. Cylindrical coordinate system. And cylindrical coordinate system is really just an offshot of the polar coordinate system in two dimensions. In a way, we don't introduce anything new in triple integrals. We use the same tool, which we already use effectively in two dimensions. So the way it works is like this. The usual coordinate system, x, y, z, is replaced by another coordinate system where, on the x, y plane, you use polar coordinates. on the xy plane. And uh, we, uh, we just add the z variable, the way we just added z to x and y. So the result is that instead of the xyz coordinate system, nor, no, which we normally use, we pass to the coordinate system in which we have r, theta, and z. So x and y get, get replaced by r and theta in the same way as for polar coordinates, and z is just thrown in as an extra variable. So the formulas expressing these coordinates in terms of these new coordinates are exactly the same as for polars. They are r cosine theta and r sine theta. And then we have this z. And so z we have on both sides, and it's the same variable. OK? So what, are the, what is this coordinate system good for? This coordinate system is good for describing objects which are cylindrical. Well, hence the name, right? So what, what do I mean by cylindrical? A cylinder, in general, is something which um, comes from an object on the xy plane by kind of sweeping uh, a surface um, by, by using that, that, let's say, a curve on the xy plane. So a cylinder itself, a cylinder itself is like that. We take a, 
we take a circle and we if we if we just move it up and down vertically we sweep a surface and that surface is what we normally call a cylinder right so a circle the equation of the circle on the plane simplifies in polar coordinates it's r equals r capital where this is a number and this is the one of the variables one of the coordinates in the polar coordinate system and this number is just the radius of the circle so in other words it's a circle of radius radius r so when we when we move it upside down uh, when we move it up and down like this along the z var z, z axis we create the surface in which the equation is the same in 3D, the same equation means that we also have an arbitrary value of z, and therefore we get uh, this the cylinder, the cylinder of radius r. And so, just like uh, uh, if you, uh, in integrating on uh, on a plane in double integrals, it is beneficial to use polar coordinates in describing things related to the circle or to the disk or sectors in, of the disk or annuli and things like that. It is beneficial to use uh, the, sphere, the cylindrical coordinate system for triple integrals in describing things in integrating things related to cylinders and various things that you can obtain by you from the cylinders. Okay. So, so what does the triple integral look like in, in uh, cylindrical coordinates? There is an important point which we have to, which we should not forget, which is that when we pass to a new coordinate system, there is some advantage, which is that some of the formulas simplify. But there is a sort of a price to pay for, which is that we have to insert an additional factor in the integral. Okay, so for polar coordinates. coordinates something that was discussed last week if you have an integral of a function f dA you can write it as a double integral in polar coordinates you have f of r and theta but then instead of simply putting dr d theta which you would normally put you insert an additional factor which is r so you get r dr d theta instead of the usual dx dy which we would have in the polar coordinate in the normal coordinate system what is the reason for this just to go over it one more time because we will now see how it works for cylindrical and then for spherical coordinates the, everything boils down to the area of an elementary object with respect to this coordinate system an elementary object is a, is a rectangle which you obtain by saying that x is say in this case two coordinates x and y x between some fixed value say x0 and x0 plus delta x and y is between some fixed value and that value plus some increment delta y for the x y coordinates for the rectangular coordinate system this inequalities describe a rectangle in which one of the sides is delta x and the other side is delta y right and so, the area of this rectangle is simply delta x times delta y. And this is what gives us the expression for dA as dx dy. And so it leads to, to a description of the double integral as an iterated integral in x and then y, or first in y and then x, by Fubini's theorem. But the key point is the area of the elementary rectangle, which is given by this formula. Now, when we pass to polar coordinates, the analog of this elementary rectangle is the following. We have to, to, to look at all points which, are, which, which uh, are given by these inequalities, say, r between r0 and r0 plus, plus delta r 
and theta is between some fixed value, theta 0, and theta 0 plus delta theta. And the picture will be different, right? Because, because this gives us a sector of angle delta theta. And so, and then the condition for, the, for, the, for R to be between R0 and R0 plus delta R, let's assume that this is R0, right? Just like I am assuming that this is theta 0. Of course, in, uh, in, in, this, in, uh, in this calculation, eventually you would like delta R and delta theta to become very small, whereas R0 and theta 0 are fixed, right? But I'm just drawing this picture. Um, I kind of magnify everything, so it looks like delta theta looks like a, a sort of the same magnitude as theta zero, but in fact it should be much smaller. And uh, so then, if this is delta r, this and this is confined within delta theta, and the elementary object instead of this one, we get. A kind of, uh, it, it sort of looks like a rectangle, but not exactly, because first of all, there's a certain angle here, and these are not straight lines, but these are, uh, these are segments of a circle, right? So what's the area of this? The area of this one, actually we cannot, I mean, it will be, we can, but it, it will be different. It's not so easy, simple to calculate, to give exact answer, but because we're going to take the limit anyway, eventually, uh, we only need a sort of a good approximation to this. And what's the good approximation to this? We can think of this, we can think that when delta r and delta theta are very small, this will look like a rectangle with the side delta r and what's the other side? Well, this actually has length r0 times delta theta. Right? The segment of a circle of radius r0 confined within the angle uh, delta theta is given by this formula, R0 times delta theta. And so we approximate this by the area of the rectangle with the sides delta R and R0 times delta theta. And the result of this is just the product of this. And we get R0 delta theta delta R. And so that's where, that's the, R, that's the R which shows up in the, in the formula for the integral. Here I denote it by R0 because, because I wanted to emphasize that in, for calculating this particular uh, area, I fix R0, I fix this length. But uh, when we do a general calculation, this will just become R and delta theta will get replaced by d theta and delta R by d, dr in the limit. Right? And so that's how we end up with this formula. So this is the, most, this is the only sort of non-trivial thing to remember about polar coordinates. Don't forget to put this factor R, which actually could be a good thing. I, I made it sound like it's a price to pay, that we are being taxed for, sort of for the convenience of using these coordinates. But actually sometimes, and oftentimes, this could be a good thing. And the typical example is, let's say you have an integral like this, something like 1 minus uh, x squared minus y squared dx dy. So you see, this is complicated, right? This is actually something we discussed. It's kind of similar to something we discussed earlier. This, is, this will be very difficult to take just as an integral in x and y. But when you pass to polar coordinates, this will become square. I'm not writing the limits, but uh, I'm just sort of giving a rough sketch here. This becomes 1 minus r squared, right? And now we get this extra factor r, and then we get the r d theta. And so you see, th this actually becomes a much better integral because I can introduce a new variable, let's say t, which is r squared. And if I do that, then dt becomes 2 times r dr. And, and then this actually gives me one half of dt. And this becomes, this becomes a square root of one minus t instead of one minus r squared. And this is much easier to, to calculate, right? Because the antiderivative of this is just a one minus t to the power three halves times two thirds, minus two thirds, right? 
Whereas for this one, it's much more complicated. Uh, well, in, it, imagine if it, were, it, was, it was like exponential function or something. So, so then it becomes even worse, right? So sometimes actually having this factor sim actually works in, uh, to our advantage. But in any case, we have to remember to insert it to, got, to get the right answer. Now, so this was all about the polar coordinates. But cylindrical are not that far away, not that far apart, because <laughs> for cylindrical, the only thing that changes is that we now throw in an extra variable. Namely, variable z. So we add the variable z. And now, instead of a double integral, we have a triple integral over some uh, solid, some region in a three-dimensional space. And so we have some f dA, where this dA usually, in the, po in the normal, in the, in the Cartesian coordinate system, we simply write as dx, dy, dz, right? But now, if we want to use polar coordinate system, we'll have to write this function as a function of r, theta, and z. And then we'll have to write dr, d theta, dz. And the question is, what should we put in front? There has to be some factor. And that factor is a factor responsible for the area of the elementary domain like this. In the usual coordinate system, in the three-dimensional space, in the when I say usual, I mean Cartesian coordinate system, the elementary object is, is a box uh, of, of sides delta x, delta y, and delta z, right? So it's, actually, no one corrected me. What is, what, what is the mistake here? dv, that's right. See, I'm a little rusty after a break. But uh, do, do correct me when I, when I make these mistakes. So dv, because we emphasize that this is elementary volume. It's volume, it's not area anymore. The A, of course, was for, for area, and V is for volume. So the, the elementary volume for this, for this guy is just, is just delta x, delta y, delta z, which gives, a, gives rise to dx, dy, dz in the integral, and allows us to calculate this integral as an iterated integral, first x, then y, then z, or any other, any other order that you choose. But now we choose this coordinate system, and so we have to be careful that the we have to now look at the uh, elementary object in this coordinate system. And what is this elementary object? Well, we just define it in the same way as before by simply um, I shouldn't have done it this way. I'm actually jumping ahead. Uh, let's just do it like this. This, it's, it, it really should be cylindrical, so it should be, it should be like this. Right? So it is, it is a, in a way, it's a kind of a, um, it's what you get by combining the two things. In this C, in this this face, this side of the of this of this object looks like looks like this. It's um, yes. Why is it called cylindrical? Because this is a cylinder, okay. right? Okay. He, he saved you, by the way, because I was kind of approaching to, to count how many seconds it will take for you to notice me. But uh, he saved you, so you should thank him. So the cylindrical is, is called because you, you see the, you make a change on the xy plane, and then you just throw in the z variable. In other words, the, you change the coordinates just on the xy plane, and then you kind of let the, 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 the third variable the same as before. So th this, it's the same idea as the idea for say, taking the circle and kind of just moving it up and down to get this object. No, no, the circle is fixed, right? It doesn't grow. It doesn't, the, 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 the radius of the circle is fixed. It's this R capital, right? You just think of a ring which is made of metal or something, and you just move it up and down vertically along the parallel to the Z axis, right? 
So what's the result? You sweep a surface, which is the surface of the cylinder. Right? You can only use it for cylinders. No, you don't use it only for cylinders. But well, what's in the name? You know, it's it's a it's a name. So it is a, a, it is de de derived from this, right? But um, it's, it's it's not supposed to explain everything we can do with these coordinate systems, right? right. Any other questions? All right. So, um, what's, the, what's the elementary volume of this? Well, we already know the approximate area of this. That's r dr, r delta r delta theta. And we know that this is delta z. Right? And so the volume is r dr delta, sorry, r delta r delta theta delta z. So it's the same r which we had, um, or maybe if you want r0, if you want this to be r0, the same r which we had um, in the calculation of the polar coordinates. So the, the bottom line is this factor is exactly the same as in the polar coordinate system. It's not, no, uh, not, more, not more complicated. Okay? So that's the formula we're going to use. And now let's do an example. Let's do an example. So, evaluate triple integral over e of the function um, e to the z, where e is enclosed by the paraboloid z equals 1 plus x squared plus y squared. The cylinder, the cylinder, um, x squared plus y squared equals 5, and the xy plane. Okay? So actually, let me get... Let me draw a bigger picture. So the paraboloid looks, what does the paraboloid look like? It's, it starts at the point 1 on the z-axis, and, and it opens up like this, right? And uh, the cylinder is, okay, I just erased it. So that's the cylinder. Let's assume that this is radius. This is going to be radius square root of 5, right? Because we have um, 5 is the square of the radius, as always. So the radius itself is square root of 5. And so that's, that's the circle at the base of the cylinder. And we want a figure which is a solid, which is confined by, by this, by the paraboloid, by the cylinder, and by the xy plane. So it is the, the inside of this. So it's kind of uh, concave. The surface is kind of concave. It goes inside, right? It's like a, like a, fancy, uh, a fancy glass. So what we need to do is to calculate the, the integral over this. This is our region, E, of the function E to the Z. So when you do triple integrals, you have to, so then you have to write it as, a, as an iterated integral. Okay? So you have to choose in which order you're going to integrate. So, the, so you, you're going to end up with an integral, so you have E to the Z, here, actually, z is one of the variables, so we just write it like this. It's, this is good, right, because z is one of the variables in the new in the cylindrical system. And then you're going to have the r. Let me emphasize this r again. 
That's the same R as before. And then we have R, D, R, D theta, and D, Z. So that now you want to write it as an iterated integral. So you have to choose in which order to integrate. Okay? So what's the, um, what's the best way to do it? Uh, for, th for this, uh, cylind for the cylindrical coordinate system, it's always, uh, you see, the point is that you have to choose what the base of this, actually, this is a general, general approach to when you have to choose the order. You have to see whether, what's a good projection of your object? Uh, is there a good projection onto, say, xy plane or yz plane or zx plane? That's the first question. And once you have a good projection of everything, projects onto something nicely, right? So in this particular case, it certainly does project nicely onto the xy plane. It projects just onto, onto the disk, onto d, which is um, r less than or equal to square root of 5. The disk of radius square root of 5, right? So that's this, that's this yellow. Let's, let's draw it with yellow. And then for each point in this disk, we have to, we'll have to integrate. So first of all, we'll have to integrate over the disk. And this will be the, uh, this is, I'm talking about the outer integration. I'm starting from outside. Right? When you project onto this, you are choosing the first two variables which normally, if we, were, if we were using x and y and z coordinates, that would be integrating first x and y. It's a, then you decide. You decide between x and y later. But first, we, we choose the first two. And then you, then you choose which one goes first. Right? So that's the strategy which I propose, that you're going to end up with three different integrations. Right? So the, the last one will be the integration over the remaining variable with respect to this projection. So here I project onto the xy plane, so this will be dz. But let's, let's now see what happens here. So this is going to be, in the usual coordinate system, in the Cartesian coordinate system, this would have been just uh, dx dy, which we would then have to decide, dx dy or dy dx. And once you decide, then, then in, the, in the last integration, you have the freedom um, to choose uh, what, what x and y are. So that means that you have a point here, x, y, inside. And then you, the limits will be the limits. You have to sort of draw the segment starting from the bottom of this, of this object to the top of this object, which in this case from this disk, which is part of the x, y plane, to this paraboloid. And you would have to uh, integrate in the last integration you would have to integrate from the bottom value to the top value, which in this particular case, what does it mean? The z goes from 0, right, to, um, to this value. But what is this value? This value is going to be 1 plus, this is going to be the value of z on the paraboloid. So that in the, in the Cartesian coordinate system, this would have been 1 plus x squared plus y squared. But now we are replacing this with r squared. So because we are doing the integral in the, in the polar coordinate system, we will actually write it as 1 plus r squared, where it is understood that r squared comprises x squared and y squared, the sum of x squared and y squared. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, up and down because I have chosen the projection onto the xy plane. Right? So the, the way I suggest to do to, to the integral is the following. That first, let's choose the two outer integrations, the first and the second, right? So geometrically, it means that you are projecting your three-dimensional region, three-dimensional solid, onto one of the planes, one of the coordinate planes. I'm talking now about the, really the Cartesian coordinate system. But it's a cylindrical coordinate system is not that far away from the Cartesian. So the same analysis sort of applies here. Right. So, so the projection here is going to be the disk. Right? 
But in general, it could be square. It could be something else. So th that, that would, will be taken care of by these two integrations, by the limits here. That's right. The projection goes in those two. And the inner integral is the remaining variable, which in this case is z. So to put the limits here, you have to take one of the points in the projection, in the image of the projection, which is this point, say, x, y, which actually, because we're doing polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, this would have to be recorded as r theta. Right? So this point will be r theta. And we'll have to take the, the segment along the third variable, which is a z variable, going from the bottom to the top, from the sort of the bottom lid to the top lid of this, of this figure, of this region, which, as I explained, the bottom is on the xy plane. So the z is equal to 0 at the bottom. And at the top, it's one, it's, we have to look at the equation of the paraboloid. It's 1 plus x squared plus y squared, which, because we are working with cylindrical coordinates, will be written as 1 plus r squared. OK? Let me finish the integral, and then you ask me if you have more questions. So, so then what, what, what remains to be done? What remains to be done is that we have to put also here r and theta. So we have to choose some order in which we will do r and theta. So let's say we put here dr and put here d theta. Because now we are actually, see, once we are here in these two out, outer integ integrals, we are actually doing a double integral. We are deciding how to, how to split the double integral into iterated integral. So, and what we are working with is already the image of this three-dimensional object onto the xy plane, which is nothing but, but the disk, right? So for the disk, we know what the limits are. First of all, we know that it doesn't matter in which order to take r and theta. And second of all, we know that r goes from 0 to the radius, which is in this case square root of 5, and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, right? That's because the disk, this disk, is described by, well, I, shouldn't even, I don't even have to write one more time. I just have to add here it's theta from 0 to 2 pi. And finally, we should, we should not forget to put the, the function, which is e to the z, and we should not forget to put this factor r. So I'm, I'm introducing a slightly different notation from before. Right? Normally, we would write this as e to the z times r times dr d theta, and then we put sort of brackets, and we think about integrating first this with respect to r, and then this with respect to theta, and then, sorry, integrating this with respect to z, then this with respect to theta, and this with respect to r. But I'm writing it in this way, which I think is a little bit more suggestive, that you write the, d, the dr, the d theta, dz, the d of the variable you're integrating, right next to the integral, so you remember which one it is. You see, because if in the old way, you would have to put dr, the last one, right? So the last one will get paired with the, la the first integral. The next to last will get paired with the second integral, and so on. This way, it's a little bit more intuitive. So I prefer to write it this way. But you, you can choose whichever way you like. But I hope that it's clear what I mean. Uh, well, this certainly is not clear, because it says on to, and then it says 0. So let me erase it here. And they write on to, like this. I think now it should be clear. OK, any questions about this? No? Yes? That's right. So in fact, I could have put r all the way, he all the way here. Right. Hmm? Oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Right, so I actually, I actually did it in the, in the wrong way, in the wrong order. So, this, did I do it in the wrong order? No, hold on. No, the order, of course, matters, because, see, the point is that, uh, no, no, I did it correctly. Who thinks that I did it correctly? Who thinks that I didn't do it correctly? OK, you guys fa you failed the course, no. <laughs> no. We are here to find the truth, you know. So I, but see, here's, here's the way. 
I thought about it this afternoon, actually, and uh, I convinced myself this is right. But see, here is the point. The point is, right. So the point is that we are, let me, this is actually a very, conf it, it could be very confusing. So let's actually do it slowly. You should not worry so much about the fact that here there is a dependence on R in the inner integral. What you should worry about is the fact that there is a dependence on R in the limit. So you certainly don't want to put this outside. You see? Because you want to end up with a number, okay? In other words, we can disagree on many things, but there is one thing we should certainly agree on, which is that the integral is a number, okay? It should not depend on R, it should not depend on theta, it should not depend on anything, it's a number. You cannot possibly get a number if the last integration has a limit which depends on a variable. Okay, so it's not going to work. But more conceptually, the way I'd like to think about this is as follows. And I would like to think maybe in a slightly, you know, it could be some more, more complicated domain. So what I'm doing is I'm projecting, so there is some E. And let's say I'm, I want to project it onto the XY plane. So right now, let's talk about just the Cartesian coordinate system. Let's not worry for now about cylindrical and spherical. Even in the Cartesian coordinate system, the way I would like to think about integration is as follows. That I have a, a region in a three-dimensional space, right? And what I do is I project it onto the xy variable. So now, if I have a triple integral over E, where I have f dv, First of all, I split it like this. It's going to be a double integral over d, over this d, of the single integral with respect to the, rema to the remaining variable, dz. You see, where for each, for each x and y in d, For each x and y in, uh, in d, you will have some lower limit, let's say it L of x, y, and you'll have some upper limit, U of x, y. Right? So that's what it's going to look like. Yes? So then I would just write like, oh, and here, yeah, that's right. So then here I would put da like this. Yes? That's right. In the old way. Right. So you want me to write this in the old way? Okay. So this, in the old way, would be 0 to square root of 5, 0 to 2 pi, uh, 0 to 1 plus r squared, right? e to the z, dz d theta, dr. Oh, I'm sorry, rdr. Yes, very good. Thank you. See, because it's red, so I don't see, I, I don't, I didn't see it. <laughs> rdr. Well, usually we'd write rdr, d yeah, rdr, okay, fine, whatever. We can put r inside here, maybe it's better to kind of keep track. Okay? So then normally we would put brackets like this. Is that okay? Does that make sense? So what I'm doing is just I'm trying to avoid using the brackets and instead just putting the, the differentials right next to the integral. So it becomes a little bit more clear to me anyway. But you, you are free to use whichever way you like. So, in, so this is sort of a new way to write and the old way to write would be um, F, D, Z, well, it's almost the same, D, A, over D. Maybe like this. So, but the, the main point which I would like to make is that the first two integra integrations in the formula, see, the, it's very confusing because when I say the first integration, do I mean the first integral or do I mean the actual integration you perform? This is the opposite, right? The first integral you write is the last one. It's the last integral you write is the first you calculate. Okay? 
That's right. So, that's right. So the, uh, this is the outer. The outer goes. For, the outer is written first. So that's why it goes goes last. You see. So you have to figure this out on your own. I guess at some point you just have to think about it and have a clear picture because. Because, like I said, it's very confusing. What do you call first? What do you call second? Who is on first? And, uh, <laughs> right? So the, the last integration, the last integration is the outer one. And the last integration corresponds to the projection of your three-dimensional region onto the plane. OK, that's the point. All right. So having established that, let's, uh, let's evaluate finally this integral. So what do we get? We get um, zero square root of five, zero to two pi, and then here we get r times uh, e to the one plus r squared minus one, right? Then you get dr. This integration just gives you 2 pi because the, the integrand does not depend on theta. So you just get 2 pi times r e to the 1 plus r squared minus 1. right? And finally, you integrate over r. And so, so here you want to, uh, you want to use. Um, you want to change variables. So I'll just, go, I'll just write the answer. So you get 2 pi is an overall factor. And then you get 1 half e to the 1 plus r squared minus 1 half r squared between 0 and square root of 5. Right? And so the answer is 2 pi times e to the 6 minus e minus 5. One half, well, because one half and two get canceled, so you get e to the six minus e, and and this guy gives you five, right? So that's correct. Okay, yes. It's pi. That's right. So it, like this. Thanks. Okay. Cool. So we're good with this. Yes. Is it universally accepted that? Are you talking about this formula or this formula? This? You mean this integral? Yes, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand what uh, the question is. Where R Which line, first of all, this one or this? One? This one. So yes. Here. Are you talking about the left-hand side or the right-hand side? <laughs> Sorry. The question is: Is it okay to put the R before the function of R? Oh, okay. The answer is yes. It is okay. I am suggesting this notation. In the book, it's not used, right? But it's, it, as a practicing mathematician, I can assure you that a lot of people use that. You know, it's, it, it's certainly interchangeable. They do commute, in other words. It, it doesn't matter in which order you write them. It's a, it's a more interesting point whether this guys commute, you know, whether, it's, whether it is important how you write dr d theta or d theta dr. This is a much more subtle point, which I'm, we're not going to get into too much. But certainly dr can you can put on the left or on the right of the function of r. So that's no, no worries here. OK. Let's move on. So the next one is called spherical coordinates, and it's a little bit more interesting. Sorry? 
spherical coordinates. And of course, the question is right away, why are they called the spherical coordinates? Because they should remind you of a sphere. Okay? As you, as you will see. So, let me actually keep this, let me keep this picture. So spherical coordinates work in the following way. Suppose you want to invent a coordinate system in which the sphere, it is a sphere which gets the simplest possible equation. You see, so in the, in the cylindrical coordinate system, it is a circle that gets the, say in the polar coordinate system, it is a circle which gets the simplest equation. Uh, R equals a constant. That's the circle of, ra of, a, of a given radius. In a, in a cylindrical coordinate system, the simplest equation is the equation for the cylinder. Okay? R equals R is a circle in polar coordinates equals R is a cylinder in the cylindrical coordinate system, cyl cylindrical in 3D. This is in 2D. And now I want to have some variable rho such that this equation will give me a sphere. And that's called a spherical coordinate system. And that's in 3D. So that means that this rho should really be the distance from the origin of my coordinate system to my point. Because the sphere. Uh, well, sphere with the center at the origin. The sphere with the center at the origin of radius r, capital, this one, is going to be the set of all points such that the distance from the origin to, our, to my point is, is given by this, by this number r. Let's say square root of 5, like in the previous uh, example. Okay? So note that this is not the same as r in the cylindrical coordinate system, because r in the cylindrical coordinate system is not the distance from the origin to this, but rather it's a distance from the origin to the projection of my point onto the xy plane. So that's not the same thing. Right? So you, you see right away that this is not the same coordinate system, and sure enough, this simplest equation, rho equals a constant, describes not a cylinder, but a sphere. Okay? But now, so now I got the first variable of my spherical coordinate system. But that's not enough. I need three variables, right? Because I'm in three-dimensional space. So I need to complete this row by two additional variables, two additional degrees of freedom, if you will, so that I could give each point a unique address by using those three coordinates. What are they? So the Standard there are different ways actually to do it, but the standard convention which we are using in this class and in this book is the following, that we, we measure two angles. In addition to rho, we measure two angles. And the first angle is exactly the same as before, it's theta. It's the theta of the cylindrical or polar coordinate system. Okay? And so we need one more. And we find this one more by measuring the, this angle, and we call this phi. So the spherical coordinate system has three coordinates, rho, phi, and theta, where only one of them is part of the, of the cylindrical coordinate system. This theta is part of the cylindrical coordinate system. But the others are new. OK? So by the way, notationally, phi sometimes is, is also uh, is written like this. It's the same thing. So I, I find it easier to write phi like this. But uh, when you type, for example, and in, on, in the book it's written like this. So you can use whichever notation you like. So rho, phi, and theta. Uh, the first step, of course, is to express the usual coordinates, uh, the Cartesian coordinates, in terms of uh, rho, phi, and theta, and to see that indeed these coordinates are uh, determine the points uh, on, uh, in space. And also to see what the ranges are. So what is the formula? Well, what we can do is we can use the old formula, which is r cosine theta, and then note that r is equal to rho 
times this, uh, this is equal to rho times the sine of this angle. See, the point is that this has the right angle. This is a triangle. This is a triangle which has a right angle. And this is phi. So you can find this distance, which is r of the cylindrical coordinate system, by taking rho and multiplying by the sine of this angle. So this is um, rho times sine of phi. And now I substitute this in here, and I get rho sine phi cosine theta. Yes? Which axis is phi measured from? It's measured from z, right? So I, I did not put labels, but I should. Yeah, it's x, y, z, the standard y. Another question. Rho is not, is, is, does not belong to any plane, a priori. It's in space somewhere, right? It's just, uh, I have a point. It, it kind of it flows around it's like this, right? Wiggles around. It's not, uh, it doesn't belong to any particular plane. It's free to move, right? Because our point is free to move in three space, and so the, the segment connecting our point to the origin, it does not necessarily belong to any plane. Which one? This triangle? It has a right angle here. Because this is a projection. I don't know if it looks like a projection. It looks a little bit, it's a little bit um, crooked, I guess. It should be more, par should be a little bit more parallel to the Z plane than what I made it look like. Is that better? Slightly. Okay, so this is a perpendicular which we draw up from this point, well, our point, this is our point. We drop it onto the xy plane. So, I guess the rest is, should be clear. Any other questions? Yes? Theta always taken from the x-axis. That's right. The theta always taken from the x-axis for the projection. Everything is a little bit uh, not straight on this picture. So this is R. This is old R, which is not. This, this R is not part of the spherical coordinate system. It's part of the cylindrical coordinate system. The reason I have drawn it, I have written it here, or put this label, is to connect, to make a connection between the spherical and the cylindrical coordinates, and also to, to simplify the derivation of the formula for x, y, uh, and z. Because you, I do it in two steps. I first recall the formula for the cylindrical coordinates, which is really the same as for polar coordinates. And then I just substitute r equals rho sine phi. And then I do the same for the for this y variable. And then z is, what is z? To find z, we have to complete this to a, to a rectangle. I'm sorry? It should be. Uh, Sine theta, that's right. Thank you. All right. And uh, to find z, I have to use another right triangle, which is this one. Yes, again, I didn't draw it very well. Uh, maybe more like this. Okay. So this is a right triangle. This is phi. So z is rho times cosine phi. So if you, visualize, if you visualize this picture, you see that you don't have to memorize or write on your cheat sheet the formulas for the spherical coordinates. It's very easy. You have to remember the polar coordinates, of course. But I mean, if you don't remember polar coordinates, then uh, it's like remembering your phone number in some sense, I think. So if you remember polar coordinates, then, then the spherical coordinates are very easy just by, using, by memorizing this picture visual, or visualizing this picture. Okay. What are the ranges? So uh, uh, rho is like r. Rho is a non-negative number. Although for r, if you remember, we had a certain convention in polar coordinates. We sometimes allowed r to be negative. But in, polar, in spherical coordinate systems, uh, a system, uh, that would be, make things too complicated. So we don't do that. So, so rho is non-negative. Theta is just like in a polar coordinate system or in the cylindrical. It's between 0 and 2 pi. 
And what about phi? What are the ranges for phi? Zero and pi, exactly. Because you can go, so if this is a vertical, this is a vertical, um, the z-axis, you can go all the way down to pi, but if you go more than pi, then you can sort of approach it from a different direction, and it will be less, from that direction will be less than pi. So that's what we do. So it's going to be from zero to pi. Do you see what I mean? Yes? That's right, from the vertical. So in other words, what I'm saying is let's say, so this is the z-axis, and this is the origin. So you have a, let's suppose that our point actually lives on the, on the, YZ, on the yz plane. So, and let's, let's start rotating it. So this is phi for this point, this is phi for this point, this is phi for this point. Still less than pi, right? So we get here, it's still, I mean, what I'm trying to say is this, 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 right? We measure angle from here. But finally, when we go like this, we should not measure it like this, but we should measure it this way. You see what I mean? So this is wrong. And this is right. This is phi. So you choose whichever is shorter, whichever is smaller. And that's going to always be between 0 and pi. So pi would be this. This is pi, which is a point on the negative. Phi equals pi corresponds to points on the negative part of the z-axis. Did you have a question? Or, no? Okay. All right. Now, what are, what are these coordinates good for? Well, the first answer is, has already been given. In this coordinate system, it's much easier to describe the sphere. So the sphere is now given by the equation rho equals r. Instead of instead of x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals r squared of the, of the Cartesian coordinate system, or r squared plus z squared equals r squared, r squared of the cylindrical coordinates. It's just the simplest possible equation, rho equals a constant. So that's, in a way, justification for the, using this coordinate system and for the name. But that's not the only object which has a nice uh, uh, representation in, uh, in this coordinate system. We can also represent an, uh, a cone by the equation phi equals some fixed angle, phi zero. So that's the cone, right? Let's, let's look at this picture again. So let's suppose I fix, I fix some phi. I fix phi, and I look at all, all the points which have a given angle like this, phi 0, fixed to the z-axis. So then it's like this is a z-axis, and my point is like this. Um, I don't know. I don't have enough visual aids, so um, I have to trust your imagination and your intuition. Maybe like this is better, I don't know. So the point is that this is the angle, so the angle is fixed, so it has to be the same angle between your points and, uh, and the same z-axis. So the result is a cone. And because I don't specify what rho is, I don't specify the distance, it, could, it can go as far away as I want. So it's an infinite cone, kind of an upper cone going in a, uh, to infinity, right? So it's not bounded, unbounded cone. So don't think that I just drew one level curve for it, but it's, it goes to infinity. So the cone is given by this formula, which is again much simpler than z equals square root of x squared 
plus y squared of the Cartesian coordinate system or z equals r of the cylindrical coordinate system, which is not so bad, but this is, this is better. This is easier to handle. So these are the things you should remember. The cone and uh, the sphere have a very nice uh, expression in terms, of, in terms of this coordinate system. Now, what about the integration? What about integration in spherical coordinates, in the spherical coordinate system? So once again, we have to figure out what is the volume of the elementary object with respect to the spherical coordinate system. You see. So these are the elementary objects for the Cartesian and the cylindrical coordinate systems, which give us the usual formulas dx, dy, dz, and r, dr, d theta, dz. So now we have to do exactly the same for, uh, for the spherical coordinate system. So what is the elementary object now? Oh, and again, by elementary object, I mean simply that you impose the condition that rho is between some rho 0 and rho 0 plus delta rho. And uh, what was my second variable? Phi. Phi is between phi 0 and phi 0 plus delta phi. And theta is between some theta 0 and theta 0 plus delta theta. So let's draw this uh, an object which corresponds to these inequalities. Like this. Well, this whole thing should be kind of uh, dotted line, okay? And uh, like this and like this, okay? You see? You see what I mean? This. Well, in fact, this I can do, do it like this to make this better. So, here, what happens here? First of all, this is delta, th delta phi, right? This is my, this is rho zero. So this thing is actually between two spheres. Imagine two spheres which have very close radii, very similar radii. So this is something which is between those spheres. And it's, first of all, we cut it by saying that the angle goes between, you know, is confined within delta phi. And also, when we project this down onto the xy plane, when we project this down onto the xy plane, this angle, I'm not going to draw it all the way, for the projection is going to be delta theta. So this is a projection onto X, Y plane. You see? So now I have to evaluate the volume of this, just like I have to evaluate the volume of this and of this in my other coordinate systems. So what is it like? Uh, what is this volume equal to? Well, we don't calculate it exactly. We approximate it. And we approximate it by the volume of the cube. Uh, sorry, not the cube, but uh, a box a box whose sides are given by the lengths of this, um, uh, this um, kind of cir circular segments. There are going to be all circular segments. Okay? So the, this one is very easy to find. Well, for, first of all, this one is very easy to find. This is just delta, delta rho. This is just delta rho. That's one side. Okay. Now this one, 
this one is also easy to find. This is, you see, this is rho 0. And the angle here is delta phi. So this is rho times delta phi. It's similar to the way we found that to be r0 times, um, times delta, delta theta. So it remains to find the, this one, which I guess you cannot see this color, right? Actually, it's better than the other one. It's kind of greenish. Can you see this one? Yeah? Oh, good. OK. So this one is a tricky one, because it, you would be tempted to take rho 0 times delta theta. But th this is not correct. So this is, this is only one, there is only one subtle point here. The point is that this is the same as this. In other words, this actually is not, this is not part of a circle of radius uh, rho zero and confined within the angle delta theta. On the contrary, it is actually part of a circle on the on the plane on the x y plane. But the radius is not um, the radius of that circle is is this, which is not rho zero, but it is it is r. It is rho zero times sine phi. So that's the only point that you have to realize to to get the right answer. And so, and then you've got, you've got delta theta. I'm trying to draw this like this. This is, a project, this is on the xy plane. And so this segment is actually, its length is rho 0 times sine phi delta theta. <clears throat> okay? So the answer is, for the volume, it's approximated by um, rho zero sine phi delta theta times delta rho times delta um, times rho zero again. Well, this is rho zero, really. And times delta phi. Yes? I'm, I am, uh, I'm trying to calculate the volume of this, right? And I am approximating it by the volume of a box like this, which has the following sides. This side is rho zero sine phi delta theta. That's this. Times delta rho, which is this side, times rho zero times delta phi is the yellow side. So the end result is rho zero squared sine phi times delta rho delta phi delta theta. Okay? So the, the, the upshot of this is that when you compute a triple integral in spherical coordinates, you have to introduce the factor rho squared times sine phi. So it's a little bit more complicated than for uh, than for uh, cylindrical and polar coordinates. So the triple integral over some solid is rho theta rho times, let's write it here, rho squared sine phi. Well, since I wrote it in red before, let me write in red again. A rho squared sine phi, that's the factor to remember, d rho, d phi, d theta. Okay? One, so we do this calculation once and for all, then we just memorize it, rho squared times sine phi. And, and now after that, we can do these triple integrals by using iterated integrals for these three variables, rho, phi, and theta. Let's see how it works in practice. So here's an example. Compute the integral of x squared 
plus y squared plus z squared dv, where e, where the region e is bounded by the xz plane and the spheres. x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9. And x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 16. So between two spheres and also the xz plane. So first of all, uh, I have to say, this is a general comment. On, uh, often say on, the, on next, day, next week we'll have a midterm. On the midterm, I will not tell you which coordinate system to use, right? You have to decide yourself. So the question is, you have to look for clues. Which coordinate system? Spherical, cylindrical. You have to remember one thing, that this expression, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, simplifies in the spherical coordinate system. So if you see x squared plus y squared plus z squared, how many times? One, two, three times, chances are it's best to use, in this case, a spherical coordinate system. You see what I mean? Because this is rho squared, right? This is rho squared. If you see x squared plus y squared, that's r squared, r being the r of the polar or cylindrical coordinates. That's how you know that you probably should do use polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, depending whether you use, do a, are doing a two-dimensional uh, double integral or three-dimensional triple integral. But in this case, it's, it's fairly clear that you, you'd be better off using spherical coordinates. Now, we can visualize, we can try to visualize this. We can try to visualize this. Think of a sphere, first of all. Let me draw. Let me ju draw just a quarter of this picture. Actually, yeah, about a quarter. So that's a, that's a part of the sphere. This is a sphere of radius three because nine is three squared, right? And this is a sphere of radius four because sixteen is four squared. So let's say this is a this is a sphere of radius three, and then the, this is the inner sphere, and then there is an outer sphere which has radius 4. So see, this one is inside the other. And what you're looking for is, what you want to look at is the three-dimensional shell, which is in between the two, in between these two spheres. It's like an annulus, but three-dimensional. Annulus is between two circles, and this is between two spheres. And also, you have to, you bind, the other bound is is the xz plane. So this is the xz plane. So actually, that's not the whole thing. The whole th this is one quarter of the whole thing. Because you will also have something in, the, in this quadrant and in, in those two quadrants which are behind the zy plane. So this is one quarter, so to speak, of the picture. But I, if I try to, to draw the whole picture, it will be more confusing. So you just have to draw the same thing, but three more times. And that's what you need to calculate. Now, actually here, the way it's phrased, it sounds almost as though it is, not, it is ambiguously defined because it doesn't say on which side of the xz plane. It could be on this, I draw it on this side where y is positive, but it doesn't say that. So in principle, I could also look at the other half. But the point is that the answer does not depend on which half you choose because the function which you use, the function that you use it does not change if you, if you flip y, if you replace y by negative y. So if, if that were not the case, the problem would not be well-defined, would not have been well-defined. But actually, it is well-defined because the answer is the same, no matter, no matter on which side of the xz plane you look. Okay? Now, to compute this, you write, see, this is one case, this is one, a coordinate system where you cannot 
so easily visualize the way I explained in the previous discussion for cylindrical and, and um, um, Cartesian coordinates, where I was talking about projection. Because these coordinates do not involve any of the variables of the Cartesian coordinate system. It does not involve x, does not involve y, does not involve z. So you have to be a little bit, use your imagination, and you have to just try to describe this by inequalities in the coordinates of the spherical coordinate system. So the inequalities will be, in this case, that rho is between 3 and 4. We know this, right? Then uh, what, about, what, about, um, what about phi? Well, phi actually can be anything from 0 to pi. It takes the maximum range. And then you have to, re the condition is on theta. If there was no condition about the xz plane, if we didn't say that, if the problem didn't say that one of the bounds was the zx plane, we would write that theta is between 0 and 2 pi, which is the maximum possible value, right? This is the total range of theta. But because we are bounded by xz plane, that means that theta can go from 0 to only up to here. But it cannot go further because we are on this side. You see what I mean? So that means that theta actually goes from 0 to pi. And that's what, that's what this extra uh, bound gives you. All right? So these are the ranges. And so actually, in the spherical coordinate system, this very complicated, very complicated um, domain looks very simple. right? It looks like a box. It looks like a box. And so the integral that you get describing this in triple integral is actually going to be the simplest possible triple integral with respect to this coordinate system. And you, you can choose any order you like uh, for, for the integration because the bounds do not depend on other variables. You see, they are fixed. So it is like the basic integral. Yes? Very good question. Is, is, it, is it going to be like this for the, in all coordinates, in all, uh, for all problems for spherical coordinate system, or just for this one? Just for this one, of course, because you can uh, imagine more complicated domains in which the uh, bounds will depend on other variables, right? So I'm just gi giving the simplest possible example. Okay, so so here you're going to have, uh, say, rho from three to four, and then. Uh, phi from 0 to pi, and theta from 0 to pi. And then you don't forget your function, which is rho squared. And don't forget the extra factor, which is rho squared, this one, rho squared sine phi. So times rho squared sine phi, d theta d phi d rho rho squared sine phi. Huh? Sorry? Why is it rho squared times rho squared? It's called rho. Rho. <laughs> so that's actually a good question on the midterm would be, what is this variable called? You know, <laughs> and so if you write for p p for the, for this, then you get an, uh, point deducted. So this is rho, right? Anyway, so th this rho squared comes from the integrand, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is rho squared, and this rho squared comes from the extra factor. So the the net effect is that you got rho rho to the fourth sine phi. So then you get a very simple manageable integral, okay? I'm sorry? Hold on, hold on, there's one, one, one minute left. Yes, one again? Rho squared, sin, rho squared sine phi is always there, and then you have the function, okay? So we'll continue on Thursday.